So, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Before I start, I would like to see some of your hands, and I would like to understand how hard it will be to convince you of uh, the uh, role of satellite in this uh, uh, broadband or in this digital divide. So let me check on it. Who of you is working in the satellite industry today? Who has worked before in the satellite industry? Okay. Who knows about KA band? Okay. Who thinks satellite communication will have a role in the digital divide or bridging the digital divide in um, Asia? Okay, so we'll have to need some convincing power, I believe. Okay, good. Well, I think this will be an interesting, um, an interesting discussion, and of course, I'm uh, open for um, answering some of the questions uh, later on. So let me start by introducing myself. I'm Serge van Herk. I'm the CEO of a company in Belgium called uh, NewTek. And uh, I think indeed uh, it's useful that I give you a small overview of who we are. We are a technology company, uh, well known in the broadcasting world. So we are proud to say that more than 2 billion people, and you as well, look to television images every day that have been somewhere transmitted over satellite with our new tech gear in the transmission chain. We've been able to build out over the last years also an important um, position in consumer broadband over satellite in Europe with a major customer like SES uh, using the Astra to connect uh, brand. We've been recently also successful in uh, securing some KA band deals uh, with SES, also with Yasat and Avanti. Those are some of uh, the important satellite operators in Europe, the Middle East and Africa. Um, our strategy is one of uh, product leadership in our industry and in the uh, satellite uh, industry. We have also in a specific uh, relationship with the European Space Agency we get quite some fundings for developments uh, in this area. We have a strong portfolio in the, um, uh, television equipment and IP appliances for transmission of a satellite. And we are a small or medium enterprise uh, growing over the years. We are now a team of about 320 people around the world and a revenue figure of about 65 million US dollars. So I understand that I'm a relatively small company, but in our industry we are quite uh, well known for the technology that we provide. Now, what will we be talking about today? Well, we'll be talking about satellite broadband and the value chain that goes with this. So here you can see in a schematic overview who are the different players in a value chain for providing, let's call it ADSL over satellite. And you have on the left side the satellite operator, the one who is operating the satellites in the sky. You have on the ground the satellite access provider, so typically the one who is uh, providing the infrastructure or operating the central infrastructure. Then you have the ISPs, the Internet Service Providers, who provide a service towards the end user. The end user being consumer or small medium enterprise uh, who needs um, broadband connectivity over satellite. And we new tech, we are the technology provider in that. So we provide hub infrastructure to the satellite access providers and we provide um, terminals towards the ISPs we sell that to the end users. So that is the way the value chain is working. You see here an example of how it works in Europe uh, with SES Astra to Connect, who plays the role of satellite operator and um, uh, who also operates the gateway, the global or let's say the central um, uh, hub infrastructure. Then you have distributors, customers like uh, Deutsche Telekom, Nornet and other customers or distributors in Europe, ISPs distributing the service towards the end users in the different countries. Now, when we look at the deployments that we have done up to now, well, we have done that with several satellite operators. Uh, we have done that with SES, with Utilsat, with Intelsat, over different um, regions of the world. But most of our terminals, uh, over 100,000, have been shipped mainly into Europe, to consumers uh, in Europe. Now, we're talking about the digital divide in Asia, I've been looking to some numbers and we see that uh, Asia, uh, at least in 2011, uh, had uh, the biggest number of internet users um, all around the world, uh, 922 million to be precise. So you might wonder, well, is there indeed a digital divide to be bridged? But then when you look indeed to the penetration, there you see indeed that there is still a long way to go for Asia to catch up with the world average or to catch up, uh, for instance, with um, North America or with Europe. So indeed, there is a digital divide that still needs to further bridge them in Asia. So what can be the role of satellite in that? Well, I'm not saying that satellite uh, will be the key technology will, which will bridge this uh, digital divide, but uh, what I'm trying to convince you of 
is indeed that satellite has a role to play. Has a role to play typically for those customers uh, who are too far away of other terrestrial infrastructures, or it's too expensive to put fiber into um, the ground and connect uh, users uh, to um, uh, the um, uh, terrestrial infrastructure. So we see that combining, for instance, direct to home, so delivering television images uh, towards the homes, and in some cases also providing interactive internet over satellite is indeed a viable business case uh, for uh, different regions of the world and I'm sure also here in Asia. There are some examples like with IP Star who is doing that um, in uh, several uh, countries. I think another example is NBN in um, uh, Australia who will be launching two new satellites uh, in the next years to provide internet connectivity over satellites to consumers. So satellite has a role to play. Now let's look at K-Band. I've seen that not many of you know or have heard about K-Band, so I'll, I'll be um, a short bill trying to show you the essence of K-Band and what this means for satellite service providers in this region. K-Band is in fact a frequency band that is now being used more and more by different satellite operators around the world. We have had um, K-band satellites are being launched in the US and Europe very recently, or let's say in the last two to three years. And we see more and more satellite operators around the world who are preparing themselves to launch additional K-A-band capacity. K-A-band, that's something like 30 gigahertz uh, transmission frequencies. So that is typically double the frequency of what is being used today in KU-band, or even um, uh, four times uh, what it is in C-band. So with the new K-band infrastructure, we are definitely in our satellite industry, transforming our industry. I guess many of you know the satellite industry as being something expensive, uh, expensive um, uh, capacity um, uh, over satellite, that's KU-band, that's C-band. When we talk about transformers worth uh, 1 million um, uh, US dollar or 2 million US dollar a month, uh, a month, a year, sorry, you are not surprised about that. So that has been something which, with uh, what we had to live with, but that made it also quite expensive to go over satellite. Now the great promise of KA band is the following. Huh? If you compare the traditional existing KU band satellites uh, that uh, we traditionally know uh, all over the world, and here I take an example of an uh, African, uh, a European African beam of Arabsat, typically what is the cost, what is the capital expenditure to um, send a satellite um, into geo, into um, a geo orbit, well, it's something like 400 million US dollars. That's the price for the satellite, the launcher, and the insurance. You have a capacity of about three gigabits on that satellite. So if you make then the calculation, how much does it cost you to get a megabit into the sky? Well, it's something like 133 um, uh, US dollars. So it tells you indeed that it is um, not very uh, cheap. It is um, um, quite expensive, but for DTH, it's a very good solution. Now, the great promise of KA band is in fact a promise of reusing frequencies, having much smaller beams, and there you can see on this slide an example of a satellite called KASAT from Eutelsat over Europe, where you have 80 beams and where uh, you have a total throughput of about 100 gigabit per second for an investment of, let's say, 500 million euros. Dollars. Might be a little bit more, might be a little bit less, depending on the satellite configuration. But what it shows to you is that the Capital expenditure per megabit has dropped phenomenally, huh? going from uh, 133, you go to 5,000 uh, uh, um, dollars. So quite a, a big uh, reduction in cost. So it enables the industry to reduce the cost per, uh, per bit that is being transmitted. So that's a good thing. But KU band, compared to traditional KU band, is different between two major things, huh? Propag propagation uh, characteristics and uh, also because of its uh, spot beam configuration. What does that mean? Well, I'm not going to bore you too much with the details, but KA band also means more rain fate attenuation. So you have to make sure that you put into place the right technology on the ground to make sure that you mitigate those um, uh, issues. And in Asia, we know that we have quite some rain, so we have to design the satellites and the te technology in such a way that you don't have uh, too much impact of that rain fate attenuation. Now there are some other uh, impacts due to the network configuration. Uh, those networks um, uh, are being accessed through a limited number of gateways. It's a star configuration. Typically the gateways are being uh, operated by the satellite operator. 
but we see that there is an evolution in the value chain enabling in fact um, uh, selling k-band megahertz capacity and providing co-location services which is I think important for this region of the world. Now looking at the type of technology that you need on the ground so here you can see um, the type of technology that we provide to our customers so let's call it an ADSL kind of a device but over satellite where you have a small modem a small dish, an interactive LNB that can provide you speeds up to 32 megabit down and with a return speed of 3.5 megabit. So that shows you indeed that speed-wise we have um, similar or, um, or even better in some cases um, efficiencies or speeds uh, compared to ADSL. Another interesting thing of this technology is that you can have it installed by the consumer himself. Uh, if you compare that with ADSL you always have to have an installer going on site so that is an additional cost, but it's also an additional bottleneck. Uh, the number of installs you can do per day is limited to the number of um, people who can install such equipment. With our technology here, with what we call point and play, you can also avoid that bottleneck. You don't have an installer to go on site, you can ask the consumer to do it by himself. I'm not going to explain too much how that works. I think you just have to remember that with this tool, point and play, you can do the installation by yourself. It's as easy as installing a direct to home terminal at your house. This technology enables, in fact, new business models, which are very important. The first one is that you can just order by internet, for instance, your uh, terminal, and that it can be sent by through the post to you, and you can do the installation by yourself. Or the other alternative is that you can just go to the shop, buy your equipment, go home and install it like your DTH um, uh, terminal and you, go, you can go live on the internet. So that's the importance of having that capability, that point and play capability of that self-install um, uh, for the consumer. So in conclusion, with those uh, few slides, um, uh, I hope indeed that I have um, uh, shown you that K-Band um, will be complementary K-band satellite will be complementary for closing the digital divide in Asia. I don't expect hundreds of millions of um, consumers um, to go online over satellite, but I expect that we're talking about several millions over the years. That with existing KU-band infrastructure, what is existing today, you can already start and provide uh, fast broadband access um, to customers who uh, need it already today. But at the end, that the key for su success is not only the technology, but also, of course, the access to the distribution channels. Uh, satellite is a good technology, but at the end, who will be buying the uh, service? It's the consumer, and they have to be able to buy that from somebody they know, or a brand that they know, and that they will rely upon. They will not buy it from a small satellite um, uh, company um, that they don't know of, so they, you need to put into place the right distribution channels to have the right uh, partners uh, to sell this kind of uh, technology. I understand I have been very short, but uh, uh, the time was short indeed, uh, and I'm happy to answer any questions on this kind of uh, technology indeed that uh, we've been using now um, very uh, heavily, in, well, heavily in the US. There are over 1 million users in the US. There are at this moment about uh, 120,000 users in Europe, and we see that growing in the Middle East and in Africa, and we hope also to see a further growth uh, in Asia with this type of uh, technology. Thank you.